apologetics must, must be a part of church discipleship. That's why morality is a relative in Americans throughout the West today, because man now determines truth. And I believe that that's why the nation is in the state it's in, because uh, they don't know the Word of God, and because the church has failed, in a sense, to hold forth the Word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Welcome to Heritage of Truth. Today our guest is Dr. Gordon Wilson. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. You have an amazing movie called The Ride and the Dance. Why don't you tell us about that? About almost three years ago, my nephew um, came by and said uh, an investor wanted him to uh, do a nature documentary because the investor was fed up with nature documentaries that were uh, all evolutionary. And he was also frustrated that a lot of his extended family was imbibing a lot of, they were Christians, but imbibing a lot of the evolutionary worldview. And he just was tired of it. And he wanted Nate, uh, Nate, my nephew, is also a best-selling author for Random House, uh, Young Readers, and has written some fantasy books. And he uh, came over to my uh, place and said, I'd like you to be the narrator. And I'm a biology professor professor at a small Christian liberal arts college, New St. Andrews in Idaho, and um, I also took him out collecting insects when he was 10. So I was sort of the go-to person. He, he knew that that's what I loved. He knew that I loved nature, and so he just asked me to be the, the narrator and host. Who actually wrote the, the script? Well, actually, he uh, he's such a good writer. I offered, but he, he went ahead and wrote the script. It's not real heavy biology. And mm -hmm. and so anything that seemed um, a little off, I may tweak in the in the uh, voiceover. But um, yeah, he wrote he wrote the script and and then I did the voiceover, except for when it was ex temp in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was just speaking in the field on camera and it was it wasn't. Um, composed or anything. Okay. So the riot and the dance, why was it called that? Was it your name or was it? Well, it was my name. Uh, I had named my textbook, The Riot and the Dance, uh, that was published a few years ago. And uh, he liked that title. The reason I picked it for my, my text title was uh, I wanted to do a biology textbook that was just different than most biology texts and that um, that was personal and um, just didn't wasn't this dry, stuffy um, uh, regurgitation of facts. I felt that riot and the dance kind of encaps, encapsulated the, the the creation because it's it was subjected to futility mm -hmm. because of Adam's sin, and so we see uh, a lot of riot. Mm -hmm. We see predator prey, we see parasite host, we see pathogen host. We're often fascinated by that part in, in uh, nature documentaries. We see the crocodile taking down the wildebeest and we're, we watch with morbid fascination. But it, it shows that it's a broken world. I think a lot of people, even Darwin himself, was, uh, was repulsed by all of this grossness. Um, and a lot of people think, well, how could a God do that? Well, we did that. Mm -hmm. Our sin is what plunged the creation and says in Romans, all creation groans. And so we, we didn't want to just present this basket of kittens nature documentary, the cute and fuzzy side of nature. We really wanted people to see both the beauty, the dance, and the riot, which is mm -hmm. the result of the curse. The dance, the, it's choreographed. I mean, the cycling of, uh, of nutrients, the ecosystems, whether it's a carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, the mutualism, all of these things interacting in the environment, uh, it's, a, it's a dance. Mm -hmm. And even at the molecular, cellular level, it's a dance. Mitosis, meiosis, all of these cell, cellular division, biochemical pathways, it's a, it's a dance, but it's at the same time, it's a riot if you went down there and saw the molecules moving, it would be a riotous dance. Mm -hmm. So there's a good aspect of riot. There's a, there's a riot also, apart from the fall, I don't think the trees would have been planted in rows 
in in the wilderness. Mm. Um, it's it's a it's chaotic, but it's beautiful. So the plants are you know uh, are chaotically arranged but beautiful. The animals aren't marching lockstep in ranks. It's riotous but beautiful. Mm. So that's a good part and of it. And there's riots of color too. Riots of color too. <laughs> yes. So it's not all negative. Yeah. Yeah. I love the title. It's a very artistic well, good. title. Good. Well, there's yeah. a bit of that in me too. Yeah, really? Yeah. I could tell that um, by your narration. And, um, mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I, I think if you're in nature all the time, you know, the artistry of God is so oh, obvious. How can you so, not catch a little bit oh, of it? It is so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. You received a sticky note with a message on it when you were in college. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, it was in entomology, and um, it was a week after my uh, oral exams, and I received a sticky note. Um, Gordon, you'll never be able to call yourself a biologist if you continue to hold the views about evolution you demonstrated last week. Uh, you're a bright person. Start using your own mind. So um, that was put on an article um, blasting uh, creation science, some article from South Africa, some journal mm -hmm. article, and he stuck it in my box. Um, and I, I wasn't offended at all, mm -hmm. not at all. He was a, a great entomologist. I was one of his uh, best students going through the program. And so he wasn't insulting me mm -hmm. at all. He just said, you're a heretic. I mean, because evolution to a secular biologist is like, would be the equivalent of the Trinity to Christianity. You might be a smart guy, but you can't be called, you can't be calling yourself a biologist because in order to be a biologist, by their definition, you must uh, pull the party lever on uh, evolution. And I had, ex in the orals I exposed myself, I was asked a loaded question I answered it the way evolutionists would would like, and then I said, but, and then I dug myself in a hole. To make a long story short, basically, it's just saying that I think God had something to do with it was enough to make one of the committee members turn purple. And um, so, mm -hmm. there you have it. Wow, but you still got your case. Yeah, uh, in fact, the guy that turned purple was the first to say when I left the room, well, as far as I'm concerned, he passed because apparently I had dug myself out of the hole and convinced him that I was a reasonable person. He just figured, well, I haven't learned enough. I'll come around. <laughs> you uh, haven't come around, have you? No, I haven't come around. And I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, it's a real problem in... In uh, not just schools, in, in the textbooks, in the element, you know, all the way from element, even kindergarten, I think they talk about about evolution on television. In, oh, it's uh, everywhere. Museums. Museums, uh, national parks. Yeah, uh, everything. everything. You get it from all angles. You don't even have to be in biology to have it be inculcated into you. Yeah, I heard a health talk the other day, and they talked about evolution. I'm thinking, okay. What does this have to do with what you're talking about? It didn't, yeah, at all. And right. it's like they—they, they, it's almost like they—they they feel like they have to keep indoctrinating people because I think it's because there isn't the evidence to mm -hmm. prove it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Francis Crick, uh, co-discoverer of DNA, said you must constantly keep in mind that what you see was not designed but evolved. So it's just apparent to everybody that it it is designed. Um, but they want to convince the public that it's apparent design, not real design. <laughs> that um, natural selection and evolution is just a design substitute. But it's not, because in Romans 1.20, uh, it says, God's invisible qualities, his divine power have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made, That's so that it. men are without excuse. And yeah, that might have been a paraphrase because I didn't have a wana when I was a kid. What do you think parents can do to help their children grow up I mean, amidst all of this evolutionary stuff around them, believing the truth? First, show uh, them the movie, the right? Yeah, dance. show them the movie. Uh, one thing that my dad taught us, I w went to public school. Uh, I wish Christian schools had been invented then, but... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
I was taught evolution all the way through, but I realized around seventh grade that, well, there's an incongruity between what I'm learning at school and what I'm learning uh, at church. And I had to sort that out. He taught us how to think critically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even a parent who, uh, parents who don't have a biology degree, they should still um, know the resources, know to send their, if their kid is asking questions beyond their knowledge, they should uh, get resources either from Answers in Genesis or other, right. other um, organizations that provide lots of um, good, uh, good answers at all age levels that will will teach them that you know evolution is not all, all that it's cracked up to be it's yeah. it's just a it's a it's a house of cards mm -hmm. my daughter was, it was about seventh grade when she started having her doubts too and i handed her um one of the answers in genesis books on dinosaurs mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and she was convinced by the end of the book yeah. and i think parents need to also just let their kids explore we sometimes kids in a curricular straitjacket mm -hmm. and say, well, you got to check all the boxes and do this and do that and and then I'm educated rather than just have this childlike curiosity and explore and and let let the kids bring in my mom wasn't crazy about snakes but you know <laughs> she did not want to quench my my curiosity so she let me have some things uh, as long as, you know, you've got to have house rules, but mm -hmm. um, we don't want to quench that innate curiosity. And we want to not be so structured that we kind of put a, a lid on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. It's really important for kids to get out and explore. Explore and catch frogs and, you know, I, I, I think herpetology, which is reptiles and amphibians, just lends itself well to kids because you can get them, but you can't get birds. <laughs> you have to be content just looking at birds through binoculars. Right. In creating this movie, do you have any stories to tell? I mean, you were out, out in the wilds a lot. Yeah, everything went really smoothly. I mean, we didn't have any harrowing experiences. We went to Arizona. We Not went... even handling all those snakes? No, I mean, I got nipped by uh, a coach whip, but it didn't hurt. Yeah, it was just wonderful. Um, I would say nothing harrowing, but um, going down to the Sonoran Desert was really great for me. Some people would say, what about Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka was wonderful, too. It was just exotic. I just felt like I was in a dream. And um, it was and finding things that were common there, but they were exotic to me. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful, catching some lizards over there. Um, we were uh, messing with some venomous snakes in, in Sri Lanka. They were captive snakes, but with someone who knew how to handle them. And that was just a, a great experience uh, to hold a tail of a cobra, a five foot cobra without it being restrained. I mean, it was just focused on the cameras. It was hooding up, looking at the cameras, and I was on the back side of it holding its tail. Wow. That was a... Uh, that was a yeah that was the part that looked really scary <laughs> yeah but it wasn't because if it turned it, it it would be easy to to let go they're not the fastest uh, oh, okay. they really have to get into position and you can easily let go before the kids don't do this anymore. yeah don't don't <laughs> don't do this I, I wouldn't have been doing it and but i saw him mm -hmm. and he was very experienced at, at right. what he was doing but uh, I love being there and seeing the exotic wildlife, but then being in the Sonoran Desert, seeing and interacting with creatures that I'd only seen in field guides because I'd never been down in the desert before. Yeah. Why, why did you guys pick Sri Lanka? Well, there was a family connection. Um, my uh, nephew, a different nephew, uh, Davis Wilson, had married uh, Manisha they met at law school in New Jersey, and her stepfather was the president of the um, uh, Sri Lankan Conservation Society. Oh, wow. And so it was a perfect fit, and he um, kind of was our host. Um, 
uh, when we got to Sri Lanka and um, accompanied us for most of the, mm -hmm. the trip. We were able to get good places to go from him, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun. So now, his name's Ravi Correa. Ravi Correa, okay. Yeah. So there were some large animals in there. Yeah, um, elephants. We yeah, got did to, you actually see those? Or yeah, those? we saw elephants, and we, um, yeah. we had cameras mounted on drones so we could um, get some good... Uh, aerial shots of elephants as well as um, ground shots. The photography was wonderful. Well, I, uh, my son Dane did a lot of the, the camera. There was three cameramen, mm -hmm. um, but my son Dane is um, did the editing and mm -hmm. yeah, he was yeah. the director of photography. So he did a, an excellent job. Yeah, the, the whole movie is really enjoyable, except for there's one part, one caution for parents is is when that one animal is being killed and eaten. <laughs> well, there was a there was a a warthog ripping at a carcass. Yeah, a I water think that buffalo. Was, that yeah. that was it. Yeah. Yeah, but it was so, a pretty far yeah, gone I mean, carcass. It, you probably see a whole lot worse on on yeah. the National yeah. Geographic Channel or something. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. Um, just a caution for people who have sensitive children. Yeah. But it is a wonderful movie. Um, it just I was just thoroughly enjoying it as I watched Good. It. Yeah, Good. so I, I hope Well, it was wonderful it. making it. I bet it was. So are you being, planning to do any more? Yeah, we're going to do part two, which will be water. Okay. So land or earth is part one, water part two, which oh. will be 2019, Lord willing. 2019. That sounds yeah. wonderful. Is there an after event? That yeah, there there is an after event. Um, the nature documentary will be about an hour and 20 and then um, N.D. Wilson, my nephew, and I will be in the studio um, discussing the film a little bit, and then we'll um, throw a few questions to three men that we asked to, to interact with the questions we gave them. It's Ken Ham, oh, um, okay. Eric Metaxas, oh, yeah. and Propaganda. And Propaganda, uh, Jason Petty, he's a uh, Christian hip-hop artist Oh, okay. And so he kind of interacted with some of the artistic aspects. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very artistic film. Good. Yeah. Good. I loved it. I just loved that part. Good. Of it. Where can people find out more about you and about the movie online? Online, go to riotandthedance.com. Riotandthedance.com, and that's the website. You can uh, find your theater and type in your city or zip code and it'll pull up all the theaters closest to you that will be showing it. It will be shown one night uh, March 19th and it like we said it's for all ages you know as Neil Diamond once said pack up the babies and grab the old ladies let everyone go. <laughs> it's great for the whole family and uh, March 19th and theater near you hopefully. if you. One other question is your textbook, do you think, applicable for homeschool parents to use in high school? High school, yes. Okay. Um, I use it for uh, college, but um, I, I cover the textbook in a semester, but if you, um, it's designed to be spread over a year. Okay, so high school um, homeschoolers would probably High school enjoy homeschooler, this book. yes. And okay. there's a lab manual, teacher's okay. manual, um, and the text. Where can they get that book? That's Canon Press. Canon Press. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for being our guest. Thank you very much. I know.